This video will provide an introduction to viruses, their common structural features, and mechanisms of infection. For all the problems they can cause, it's amazing to think that viruses are nothing more than a highly structured collection of macromolecules. They aren't cells, and they aren't alive. You can think of them like compact little molecular assemblies that have exactly one function, to replicate themselves. But to do that, they have to infect cells. Without cells, viruses are essentially inert. They lack the ability to carry out metabolism on their own or to reproduce on their own. They are obligate intracellular parasites. They must get into cells and use cellular enzymes, energy, and organic building blocks to make more viruses, which then exit the cell and go on to infect other cells. This false colored green cell on the right is a type of immune cell called a T cell. And these little red specks are all human immunodeficiency virus HIV particles exiting or budding off from the cell, just to give you a sense of scale between viruses and the cells they infect. All living organisms, bacteria, archaea, plants, fungi, animals, protists, all life forms have viruses that infect them. In this illustration, you can get a sense of the diversity of viruses, from the rod-shaped tobacco mosaic virus that infects plant cells down here at the lower left, to this T7 bacteriophage virus that infects bacteria, and all these animal viruses, SARS, Zika, HIV, Ebola. Viruses come in a diverse array of shapes and sizes, but they all exist to infect cells and make more virus. Despite their diverse shapes, viruses have common structural characteristics. They all have a genome, which can be DNA or RNA, but never both and can be either double-stranded or single-stranded. The viral genome contains few genes compared to cells, a few hundred for the largest viruses, though the typical number of genes is about a dozen. Simple bacterial cells have thousands of genes, just for comparison. Along with the genome, viral proteins are present, some of which are structural, for example, binding to, organizing, and protecting the genome, like the N proteins represented in purple here, found in association with the RNA genome of this SARS-CoV-2 virus, these red squiggles. Others play a role in infection, like these spike proteins on the SARS virus, and these tail fiber accessory proteins on the bacteriophage, both of which are critical for entry of the viral genome, or virus as a whole, into the cell. These proteins directly interact with cell surface molecules that are specific to their target cell. It could be a membrane-embedded receptor protein, cell surface carbohydrates, a cell wall component, etc. And this is why every virus has a limited range of host cells it can infect. Some viral proteins are enzymes that assist the virus in replicating once in a cell. And some of them are proteins that make up the highly ordered protein capsid, a set of proteins that enclose and protect the genome. In many animal viruses like SARS, the viral particle is covered by a membrane envelope consisting of a phospholipid bilayer and embedded membrane proteins, which the virus acquires from the host cell itself. Let's take a closer look at the molecular processes by which specific viruses infect their target host cells, starting with T4 bacteriophage. As I mentioned, bacteriophage are viruses that specifically infect prokaryotic cells, both bacteria and archaea, and they are found wherever these organisms exist. They are by far the most prevalent biological entities on the planet. It's been estimated that one milliliter of seawater contains hundreds of millions of phage particles. They outnumber bacterial cells by more than 10 to 1 in many ecosystems. The structure of T4 is shown on the left in the diagram and consists of the head, a protein capsid enclosing the DNA genome, which contains 160 genes, and a tail which contains a number of protein structures that allow the virus to attach to and infect target cells. Attachment is mediated by these tail fibers represented in yellow. Once attached, the tail functions like a syringe, injecting the DNA from the head into the cell cytoplasm. After gaining entry to the cell, the viral DNA is copied by cellular polymerases to produce more viral DNA and mRNA, which cellular ribosomes then translate to produce the viral proteins. New viral particles then undergo self-assembly. Viral enzymes degrade the cell membrane and cell wall, and hundreds of new viral particles are released into the environment, which can then go on to infect other cells. Obviously, bacteria have defenses against infection. 
If they didn't, they would have become extinct. One defense is the restriction modification system. Most prokaryotic cells have endonuclease enzymes that will degrade any foreign DNA that enters the cell, represented by this sharp-toothed little Pac-Man here. These are referred to as restriction endonucleases because they restrict the ability of phage to infect the cell. So when the phage injects its DNA, these enzymes attack and hydrolyze the viral DNA at specific nucleotide sequences, fragmenting the DNA and preventing the viral genome from being replicated or transcribed. Given that prokaryotic cells lack a nucleus, how, you may ask, does the cell's own DNA not get degraded by these same enzymes? This is where the modification part of the restriction modification system comes into play. Prokaryotic cells also have methyltransferase enzymes, illustrated as this blue Pac-Man, that will methylate those same recognition sequences anywhere they are found within the cell's genome. Because the structure of the nucleotide has been changed by the addition of the methyl group, the endonuclease can no longer recognize it, and the cell's DNA is protected from degradation. Of course, the Red Queen hypothesis that we've discussed before in the class applies here as well. There's an evolutionary arms race between virus and host cell. You can imagine that there's a driving selective pressure that would favor viruses that manage to evade the system. For example, viral DNA can sometimes integrate into the host cell genome and then hop back out, sometimes taking bits of the cellular genome with the viral DNA when they do. Some phage have acquired methyltransferase enzymes this way and modify their own DNA protecting it from degradation, which leads to the selection of different versions of restriction endonucleases that recognize different sequences, and so on. The arms race never ends. Interestingly, though they don't infect human cells, bacteriophage do have clinical relevance for humans. They have been successfully used to treat antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections. Next, we'll take a look at a virus that infects plant cells, tobacco mosaic virus. Tobacco mosaic virus was the first virus ever identified back in the late 1800s. It was so named because it causes a mosaic, mottled, light dark pattern on the leaves of infected plants. Initially identified in tobacco, this virus can infect over 350 different plant species, and it's a big problem in agriculture. The structure of TMV is pretty simple. It's a rod made up of repeating capsid protein monomers that form a helical cylinder. At the upper left is an accurate artistic representation of the viral structure, and down at the bottom is an electron micrograph of actual virus particle. The helical capsid surrounds an RNA genome that consists of only four genes, encoding an RNA replicase, an RNA polymerase, a movement protein, and the capsid protein. Its RNA genome is single-stranded, and because it effectively functions as a mature mRNA molecule once it gets into cells, this virus is classified as a positive sense RNA virus. So what does the replication cycle of TMV look like, and how does it differ from bacteriophage? First of all, there's not really a specific molecular interaction that mediates attachment of the virus to the plant cell exterior. Instead, initial cell entry is through an abrasion or wound that disrupts the plant cell membrane, allowing the entire viral particle to enter the cell, not just the genome. In order for the genome to be exposed and new viruses produced, a process called uncoding has to occur, in which the protective protein capsid is removed releasing the core viral components into the cell cytoplasm. In TMV, this is accomplished by cellular ribosomes. The RNA genome of the virus has a 5' methylguanine cap, just like cellular mRNAs. So cellular ribosomes will bind the end of the RNA and start scanning to initiate translation, displacing capsid proteins as they move along the RNA. This is referred to as co-translational disassembly. Once uncoded, the RNA genome is copied by the viral polymerase to produce the negative antisense RNA complement, and then copied again to produce the positive sense strand genome. 
As this is happening, the RNA is being translated by ribosomes at the rough ER to produce more viral proteins. These viral components assemble initially into viral replication complexes, which motor proteins move to plasma desmata, cell-cell junctions between adjacent plant cells that allow the exchange of cellular nutrients and other materials. The viral components move from cell to cell, spreading the infection throughout the plant tissue, depleting the plant's resources, and causing stunting, malformation, and ultimately tissue death. As concentrations of the viral components increase within the cell, further self-assembly spontaneously occurs, producing the mature helical viral particle. Because the virus is spread throughout the plant tissue, including into the sap, chewing insects like grasshoppers can transfer the virus from one plant to another as they feed, as can humans if they're not careful about washing up after handling diseased plants. And this mechanical spread by humans is the main mode of transmission in agricultural crops. The last virus I'll talk about is human immunodeficiency virus, the virus responsible for acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or AIDS. The name of the clinical syndrome accurately describes the diabolical effects of the virus. HIV is spread through contact with some body fluids, including blood, semen, and vaginal secretions. And once in the body, HIV infects a number of different cell types, but it particularly targets a population of immune cells called helper T cells, which are critical for mounting an effective immune response to pathogens. By targeting and killing these immune cells, the virus essentially cripples the immune system. And without treatment, infected individuals suffer a number of opportunistic infections and cancers which is what eventually causes their death within about 10 years of infection, again, if the infection is untreated. As we'll discuss in a minute, with proper treatment, HIV-infected individuals can live a pretty normal life. AIDS exploded into a global pandemic in the 1980s, and although we hear less about it because effective therapies have been developed, it remains a significant health problem in many parts of the world. There are millions of people across the globe living with HIV, and though globally the new infection rate has declined by about 25% from its peak in 2010, millions of people are newly infected every year, and hundreds of thousands still die from AIDS every year. And while infection rates are declining in many parts of the world, including North and South America, Western Europe, Western, Central, and Southern Africa, and the Asia-Pacific region, Rates are increasing in Northern Africa and the Middle East and in Eastern Europe. In addition, while infection rates are declining in Sub-Saharan African countries, as you can see from the chart in the lower right, they are still disproportionately affected by AIDS-related deaths compared to other parts of the world, largely due to lack of access to affordable therapeutics. The bottom line is that HIV-AIDS is still a huge health crisis worldwide. HIV is classified as a positive, sense-strand, membrane-enveloped retrovirus. Like tobacco mosaic virus, HIV has an RNA genome that can be immediately translated in the infected cell to produce viral proteins, hence the sense-strand designation. Unlike TMV, HIV is a retrovirus, which means that once it infects a cell, it copies its RNA genome into DNA and that DNA can then integrate into the host cell's DNA, becoming part of the cellular genome. We'll see the details of how that happens in a moment. Like most animal viruses, outside of the protein capsid protecting the viral genome, HIV contains a lipid membrane coating, or envelope, that it acquires as it leaves an infected cell via exocytosis. This membrane is derived from the host cell plasma membrane and contains both host cell membrane proteins and viral specific membrane proteins. Infection of a T cell is initiated by attachment of the HIV virus to two receptor proteins in the helper T cell membrane called CD4 receptor and CCR5 receptor two viral glycoproteins called GP41 and GP120 are critical for mediating this interaction. Once these glycoproteins bind the cell surface receptors, 
they undergo a shape change that pulls the viral membrane and cell membrane close enough to one another that the membrane lipids intermingle, resulting in membrane fusion and penetration of the viral proteins and genome into the cell cytoplasm. To see how this fusion process works, we'll watch a short animation produced by a research group at the University of La Laguna in Spain. Once membrane fusion has occurred and the interior contents have been delivered to the cytoplasm, the viral capsid is degraded, revealing the RNA genome along with two critically important viral proteins, reverse transcriptase and integrase. What happens next in the cycle is part of what makes HIV such a difficult pathogen to try to get rid of once infection occurs. The reverse transcriptase enzyme copies and converts the viral RNA genome into a double-stranded DNA molecule. Remember that transcription refers to copying DNA to produce RNA. In this case, the opposite is happening. RNA is being copied to produce DNA, hence reverse transcription. Once the genome has been converted to DNA, a viral enzyme called integrase binds to the viral DNA chaperones it into the nucleus through a nuclear pore, then cuts a host cell DNA molecule, fusing the viral DNA into the cut site. This integration of the viral genome into the host cell genome means that this cell is now infected for life. It can never rid itself of this virus. What follows is transcription of the viral DNA, what's referred to as the provirus, to make viral RNA some of which is translated to produce viral proteins, and some of which are used as the viral RNA genome for the new virions being assembled. These viral molecules are transported to the cell surface, where exocytosis then occurs, releasing a viral particle to the outside world. At this stage, the virus is not yet infectious. One last enzymatic reaction is needed. The viral proteins are produced as one long polypeptide, which must be cleaved apart into separate viral proteins in order for the interior capsid to fully assemble. This cleavage is catalyzed by a viral protease enzyme. Once that has been accomplished, this is now a mature HIV virus that is competent to infect other T cells in the body, which can pretty rapidly deplete the number of T cells and compromise the immune system. This is actually just scratching the surface on HIV infection because it turns out that HIV has a number of other tricks up its sleeve that allows it to evade immune detection and eradication from the body. 
we're going to see another animation that illustrates really nicely these next steps in the replication cycle of the virus once membrane fusion has occurred. This one was produced for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And what ultimately happens is fusion of those two membranes and the viral genetic material is injected essentially into the cell and the envelope protein is left at the cell surface. The virus has a matrix and a capsid protein shown here in green and red that, that essentially are digested when it enters into the cell. That releases the viral enzymes and the viral RNA. And here we have reverse transcriptase, which takes the viral RNA and using host nucleotides, converts that viral RNA into a single strand of DNA. While it does that, it makes some random errors, which is characteristic of reverse transcriptase. It has very poor proofreading activity. That single-stranded DNA now is again reverse transcribed into a double-stranded DNA. At that point, another enzyme that has come in with the virus in the beginning called integrase essentially grabs hold of that double-stranded DNA and carries it through a nuclear pore into the nucleus of the cell. Within the nucleus of the cell, it finds the host chromosome, and it basically, the integrase enzyme, makes a nick in the host DNA and allows for HIV to insert itself into the host chromosome. And that right there is what establishes lifelong infection. Now, RNA polymerase comes along and makes messenger RNA. Those messenger RNAs encode for different viral proteins. They end up associating with ribosomes on the, at the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And here's a piece of mRNA that's making envelope protein, which is directly produced into the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's shuttled then through the endoplasmic reticulum and taken to the cell surface, where at the cell surface, it becomes embedded in the cellular membrane and at this point, coalescing with other envelope proteins that have been produced, you have this cluster of envelope proteins now on the surface of this infected cell. At the same time, there are other messenger RNAs that are being produced that allow for translation of other uh, viral proteins. So here are additional viral proteins being made, which are going to be used to make up the key components that, uh, that the virus ultimately is going to need. These are transported again to the cell surface to the area where these envelope proteins are, and a strand of RNA as well as a, some of the enzymes are part of that complex. This then buds off at the cell surface at this point, but it's still not a mature virion because the polyprotein chain needs to still be digested into its component parts. That's done by an enzyme called protease. Protease breaks up those uh, polyprotein chains and ultimately allows for them to coalesce and form the mature uh, structures that make up the final virion. And now you have a mature infectious virion that can go on now to infect other cells. Once that happens now, the cell can produce tons of viruses, and this is really what then keeps the whole process going. Okay, now that we've taken a look at the viral replication cycle, let's talk about those treatments for HIV that I mentioned at the beginning of the video and see how they can stop HIV in its tracks and make a more or less normal life possible for HIV positive individuals. In theory, all of those components of the viral replication cycle that we just talked about are potential drug targets to either prevent infection or stop the infection from spreading. So you can imagine that you could design molecules that will bind to the CD4 receptor and or CCR5 co-receptor, preventing HIV from being able to interact and initiate fusion that would prevent infection in the first place. Or you could design inhibitors that would target those membrane fusion proteins, preventing them from doing their thing so the virus can't enter the cell. Alternatively, you could target the viral enzymes, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease. 
preventing the replication of the viral genome and maturation of the viral particles. In principle, you could target any of these, but the most effective therapies that have been developed are ones that target the enzymes. As mentioned in the animation, reverse transcriptase is an error-prone enzyme. It introduces a lot of mutations when it copies HIV. As a result, the mutation rate of HIV is high, which complicates drug treatment because it makes it more likely that a drug-resistant version of the HIV virus will be produced just by chance and then selected for. Because of this, effective treatment of HIV requires combination therapy in which not just one enzyme inhibitor, but multiple enzyme inhibitors are given at the same time. This dramatically reduces the likelihood of a resistant version of the virus occurring, since it would have to accrue numerous mutations, making it resistant to multiple drugs at the same time, which is highly unlikely. This combination therapy was introduced in 1995, and you can see in the graph how effective it has been in reducing the number of cases of HIV infection that progress to AIDS, shown in the solid black line, as well as the death rate for individuals diagnosed with AIDS. This therapy is called HART, which stands for Highly Active Antiretroviral Therapy, and it typically includes several different types of reverse transcriptase inhibitors, as well as protease inhibitors, and sometimes integrase inhibitors as well. As you can also see, this isn't a cure. HIV still does progress in some individuals to AIDS, and resistant strains can still arise. Newer therapeutic approaches, including the use of CRISPR technology to remove the HIV genome from T-cells, are being investigated as approaches that could lead to a lifelong cure, and research into potential vaccines is still ongoing. So far, we've focused very narrowly on the structural features, infection mechanisms, and relevance of some example viruses as disease-causing agents. But from a broader perspective, it's important to recognize that viruses don't only impact individuals within a population. Rather, they are incredibly significant biological entities from an evolutionary perspective and in the ecology of the biosphere. Viruses have long been recognized as an important driver of evolution because they can transfer genes between cells and even different species in a process called horizontal gene transfer. This is as opposed to vertical gene transfer in which parental cells pass their genetic information onto their progeny. Many viruses can integrate their genome into the host cell DNA, as we saw with HIV, including some phage, as illustrated in this diagram showing a phage-infected cell on the left, with this little bit of provirus DNA in red integrated into the bacterial chromosome, shown in blue. This DNA is then cut back out of the chromosome by viral enzymes and can be assembled into new viral particles. But sometimes, a bit of the host cell DNA is cut out as well and comes along for the ride. If that virus then goes on to infect another cell, this bit of DNA gets transferred too. We've talked before in the class about how plasmid exchange between bacteria is a main mechanism by which antibiotic resistance spreads through microbial communities. This transduction of DNA by viruses is another important driver of antibiotic resistance, as well as the transfer of virulence factors between species. Viruses can transfer genes between cells of the same species or across species, and because of the existence of parasites and endosymbionts, can even transfer genetic information across the domains of life, for example, from a bacterial endosymbiont to the DNA of the eukaryotic host cell. DNA sequence analysis has made clear the extent to which this type of horizontal gene transfer has shaped the evolution of species, resulting in a redrawing of the evolutionary tree of life from the simple single-trunked tree envisioned by Darwin to the more accurate interconnected web shown on the right. As we discussed earlier, viruses aren't classified as alive since they don't metabolize on their own and lack self-reproducing capacity in the absence of a cellular host. But that doesn't diminish their important role in biological food webs and even as regulators of the planet's biogeochemistry, 
controlling the cycling of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in the biosphere. The ecologically important role of viruses is best understood in the context of marine ecosystems, but it's certainly not limited to that. Viruses outnumber marine prokaryotes by about 15 to 1, so they are by far the most prolific biological entities in the oceans. They preferentially infect and kill the fastest growing marine microbes, thereby maintaining balance between species and preventing any one from dominating and outcompeting the others, thus maintaining biodiversity at the microbial level. But viruses are also a main mechanism by which nutrients are recycled. As viruses infect and then lyse their host cells, dissolved organic matter, proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates and lipids, the molecules of life, and larger particulate organic matter are made available to other microbes in the community. And about 20% of the carbon fixed by photosynthetic autotrophs is recycled within this semi-closed microbial loop. This carbon sequestration is incredibly important from the perspective not only of the growth of these microbes, but also the larger biosphere, since these carbon consumers have a major impact on atmospheric CO2 levels and therefore on climate change itself. The fact that viruses can shuttle carbon from primary producers like photosynthetic bacteria to heterotrophs and back into the ocean, including into ocean sediments, means that these tiny non-living entities are important regulators of processes that contribute to global climate change. And though they're often left out of the conversation, understanding the full role that they play in these ecosystems is going to be critical for any climate change mitigation strategy.